Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, again, I'd like to thank the organising team for inviting me. It's a great honour to be involved in this uh, topic and visit your great country once again. So my topic is anti-platelets and anticoagulants uh, and regional anaesthesia, the current evidence. This is a vast topic and I've tried to uh, focus on issues that I think are relevant to our current practice and look at perhaps a little bit of bias towards the newer drugs while at the same time having a little bit of revision of older agents that we're familiar with. My disclosures, I have no financial disclosures. I do acknowledge research support from the Australian and New Zealand College of Anaesthetists. So our learning objectives this morning are to identify the reasons why we encounter patients on anticoagulation, antiplatelet therapy in the perioperative period, to summarise some of the key pharmacology and of anticoagulants, antiplatelet agents, and to identify management priorities in patients who are on these drugs. And there are many factors that influence the incidence of neuraxial complications, and neuraxial techniques really challenge us when we have patients who are on anticoagulants, antiplatelets. The published outcome rates vary uh, according to the outcome that's being measured, for example, hematoma versus abscess. But what's been demonstrated over a, while, over a long period of time is that orthopaedic patients are at much greater risk of epidural, hematoma and other complications compared to lower risk groups such as obstetric patients. And it's also clear that post-operative epidural analgesia techniques are associated with an increased risk compared to subarachnoid techniques. But perhaps the single most important factor, which has been demonstrated over a very long period of time, that when a patient has a coagulation abnormality from any cause, it does put them at higher risk of epidural hematoma. And this has been demonstrated in a recent study from the United States where with a large cohort of almost 80,000 obstetric catheters, there was no cases of epidural hematoma. And in patients who had perioperative catheters, there were seven cases of epidural hematoma. The incidence is still rare, but the difference in the incidence in the two surgical cohorts is striking. And of note, four of the seven patients who had epidural hematoma had anticoagulation, antiplatelet therapy that deviated from the current American Society of Regional Anesthesia guidelines. We do need to be familiar with guidelines. We do need to refer to guidelines frequently because the pharmacology associated with these drugs is vast. The number of drugs that are being used in clinical practice is large. There is the, there is the American Society of um, Regional Anesthesia guidelines and they've recently put out an app which I recommend, you can purchase this on iTunes. And this is very easy to use because, and it really gets, focuses on the key issues that we need to pay attention to. For example, the time period that's elapsed since the drug, last drug was given and when neuroaxial puncture takes place. And more recently, there's been guidelines that have been published on interventional spine and pain procedures in patients who are on these drugs. And while the issues in chronic pain patients are a little different, to the, to the issues that we face with regional anaesthesia, there's enough overlap that to, to, to transfer some of the information from these guidelines. And of note, ASRA will be publishing new guidelines on regional anaesthesia and anticoagulants, I believe, this year. What's particular, particularly str strong about this article is the depth of pharmacological um, review that they, and, and attention to detail in that respect. So why are patients on anticoagulants? Well, one important reason is because of stroke. And each year in England alone, over 100,000 people suffer a stroke, often with devastating consequences. This has an epic, ep economic cost of $7 billion in England alone. It's well known that atrial fibrillation increases the risk of stroke fivefold. And it's well known that atrial fibrillation is prevalent in our surgical population of up to 2.5% and even higher in our older age patients. And it's well known that warfarin reduces the risk of stroke. In this case, this patient has atrial fibrillation and you can see the risks associated with atrial fibrillation. You can get a thrombus that forms in the left atrium, specifically, specifically in the left atrial appendage. 
And you can also see in this echocardiogram clip that there's spontaneous contrast in the left atrium. You can see it floating about there. And this indicates low flow in the left atrium. And you can see there's some mobility of that thrombus in the left atrial appendage. And you can see this patient's really at risk of having a subsequent cerebral embolic event and having a stroke. Many of our patients have mechanical heart valves, and particularly patients with the older style uh, valves or the mechanical valves are at higher risk of having um, complications if their anticoagulation is ceased and, and inappropriate bridging medication is not instituted. Here's an example of a patient with a mechanical valve who stop, stop their warfarin, and you can see one of the leaflets of the mechanical valve does not move. And there's also a thrombus that's been uh, formed that you, can, you can't see it in this view, uh, that formed on, on the valve. So it's very important to main, maintain anticoagulation in patients who have mechanical valves. Next, I'm just going to review venous thromboembolism. And this study is from uh, the hospital where I work, St Vincent's Hospital in Melbourne. And what they're able to extrapolate from this article, that in Australia alone, the cost of total joint arthroplasty is $1 billion. Keeping in mind that our population is only $25 million, you can see that the worldwide cost of this therapy alone is vast. Venous thromboembolism is one of the key cost drivers. And in Australia alone, it adds $66 million to the cost of lower limb arthroplasty. The incidence of venous thromboembolism, or VTE, is relatively high. In this study, it was 5%. And this occurred despite the use of low molecular weight heparin, early mobilisation, and graduated calf compression stockings. So for patients who are at high risk of VTE, what are some of the th suggested thromboprophylactic options? Clearly, low molecular weight heparin is indicated, has been shown to be very efficacious and, and, and safe in the context of neuraxial anaesthesia, provided the, that the dosages, the appropriate dosages from the product, product guidelines are adhered to. Warfarin is also recommended along with mechanical prophylaxis. In patients who are at medium or lower risk, then a different uh, options are, are utilised and commonly in, inter, in medium risk patients, unfractionated heparin is used. In patients who are ambulant and clearly at low risk, then no specific thromboprophylaxis is indicated. Vitamin K antagonists such as warfarin are probably the most widely used anticoagulants worldwide. And these drug, this drug is indicated for a VTE, patients with mechanical heart valves and patients with atrial fibrillation. It's well known that warfarin inhibits vitamin K dependent coagulation factors in a sequential way, affecting factor seven first because that has the shortest half-life. It also affects factors nine, 10, two and circulating anticoagulants protein C and protein S. The full anticoagulant effect of warfarin takes four days. At that point, the levels of factor two are significantly decreased. In practice, the effective half-life of warfarin is between 20 and 60 hours. It's important to note that warfarin has a narrow therapeutic or safety index, and there's marked individual vari variability in the dosing responses. So it's very important that there should be careful individualisation of dosage with all patients on warfarin. The effects of warfarin are influenced by genetic factors, in particular specific genotypes, and up to 250 drugs interact with warfarin, and there's marked food interactions in addition. Extreme caution should be applied in many situations, particularly patients who are elderly and patients who are debilitated. In terms of the guidelines, the time period that should elapse between the last dose of warfarin and neuraxial puncture is five days. And there should be a normal INR at the time of neuraxial puncture. If, 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 there is, uh, if the INR is outside of the, um, the normal range and surgery does need to go ahead, then vitamin K, oral vitamin K, between one and two milligrams, or prothrombin X concentrates uh, viable alternatives to a viable options to reduce the to, to reverse the effect of warfarin. Because of the difficulties with warfarin, warfarin is likely to be superseded with other oral anticoagulants. These are known as the novel oral anticoagulants. Rivaroxaban and apixaban uh, inhibit factor 10A, and dabigatran is a direct thrombin inhibitor. These drugs have advantages because they have predictable pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic profiles. They do not require regular monitoring in the same way that warfarin requires monitoring with INR or prothrombin time. 
There is no specific antidote, to my knowledge, to reverse bleeding. However, I understand there is a large amount of um, work being done in this area. These drugs have de been demonstrated equivalence to warfarin in preventing systemic em embolism and stroke. So with these drugs, um, it's recommended that five days elapse between the last administration of the Bigatran and any neuraxial block, but it's important to realise that this figure will be influenced by renal impairment, and if a patient has renal impairment, that figure should increase significantly. With rivaroxaban, then three days should elapse. But it's important to note that there's limited data on the safety of these drugs for patients for whom an indwelling epidural catheter is planned and extreme caution should occur in that context. Another group of patients where we commonly see uh, anticoagulant, but more specifically antiplatelet agents, is patients with coronary stents, because if their antiplatelet action is not maintained, they are at a high risk of developing an instant stenosis. And the drug that's commonly used is clopidogrel, and often clopidogrel is used with, in conjunction with aspirin. Clopidogrel is a thenopyridine derivative, um, and this together with glycoprotein 2B3A antagonists, they have a diverse um, effect on the coagulation and, and platelet function. There are drugs that are specifically target the glycoprotein 2B3A uh, receptors, abixabag and tyrofiban. These drugs are difficult to pronounce. So if you see a drug that's difficult to pronounce, that's a red flag. These drugs are commonly used in emergent situations such as percutaneous coronary uh, interventions and we would not normally be using neuraxial anaesthesia in that context. The drugs that we're most likely to see are the drugs such as clopidogrel or more recently ticagrelor. Clopidogrel is a specific and potent inhibitor of platelet aggregation. It blocks the adenosine diphosphate receptor on the platelet and that then blocks the activation of the glycoprotein receptors I mentioned before, which is the final pathway for platelet aggregation. It's important to note that clopidogrel is a prodrug, so it has to be metabolised for there to be clinical effect. There are low responders, and this relates to specific genotypes which affect the drug's metabolism in the um, cytochrome um, system in the liver. There are specific drugs which act on those or inhibit those receptors, and one particular drug is omeprazole. Ticrigorello is a, is a similar drug which also acts directly on, in this case, acts directly on the same receptor, but in this case, the parent drug is responsible for platelet inhibition. The pharmacokinetics of this drug are more predictable, and it's not affected by genetic polymorphisms, and there are no known drug interactions. In terms of the time that we need to cease these drugs before neuraxial block, clopidogrel, between seven and 10 days is recommended. Some of the guidelines recommend 10 days, some recommend five days. 10 days is, is definitely a conservative um, uh, time period for, to stop the clopidogrel. In terms of ticagrelor, its offset is quicker and we can have a shorter period between when the last dose was given and when neuraxial anesthesia can be used. Aspirin is a well-known drug and it uh, causes irreversible inhibition of platelet function as a result of COX-1 inhibition. It also in, in, inactivates COX-1 in mature uh, megakarrier sites. It effectively inhibits platelet activation, aggregation and thrombosis and it has reliable pharmacokinetics. The effects of aspirin on platelets is time and dose dependent. As the dose increases over 100 milligrams, there's increased risk of bleeding for both medical and surgical patients, but the magnitude of this risk is slight. And the complications clearly increase if other anticoagulants such as heparin are given concurrently. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, including aspirin, as a sole agent do not increase the risk of spinal epidural hematoma and are not a contraindication to neuraxial block. So with aspirin, if that's the sole agent, no time needs to uh, elapse between the last dose and neuraxial anaesthesia. We can safely give neuraxial anaesthesia if a patient has been on aspirin up until the time, low dose aspirin up until the time of the operation. But caution should apply if this drug is used in combination with other anticoagulants. And the same advice applies to non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, but in practice these drugs um, are stopped in the preoperative period because of their effects on renal function um, and they're not necessary in terms of cardioprotection to continue them through the perioperative period.
So in summary, there's a large number of chemoprophylactic agents that are used in patients in the perioperative period. We need to understand the pharmacology and specific, and of these drugs. In practice, we're balancing a risk of venous thromboembolism or systemic embolism versus the risk of bleeding. And our management priorities, first of all, we need to answer two questions. Does the planned surgery necessitate interruption of the anticoagulant, antiplatelet therapy? In my practice, often that decision is made by the surgeon. If so, if the drug does need to stop because of the risk of surgical bleeding, will the patient need bridging therapy? Bridging therapy refers usually to the administration of low molecular weight heparin or intravenous unfractionated heparin during cessation of warfarin. And normally low molecular weight heparin in my practice is used because this can be administered as an outpatient and clearly there's cost uh, factors involved there. And in this context, low molecular weight heparin or intravenous heparin is used in a therapeutic dosage. So it's important to realise that it's not used as a, in a prophylactic dosage for DVT, it's used in a therapeutic dosage. I'm now going to present a real case. This is a patient who was 66 years old and was scheduled for a total knee arthroplasty. And we'll go through this patient's perioperative course and look at some decision points, highlighting, highlighting what we need to pay attention to in the perioperative period. This patient had a past history of mitral valve prosthesis and atrial fibrillation. Previous surgeries that this patient had encountered in, had, been, had been complicated, specifically pacemaker, mitral valve replacement, and total knee arthroplasty were all complicated by infective complications. In this case, for the patient leading up to their total knee arthroplasty, the warfarin was ceased between five and six days before surgery, and the INR was 1.3 the day before surgery. This patient also had a history of renal impairment. The etiology of the renal, renal impairment was unclear. It was overall of mild severity and it fluctuated. In this particular patient, post-operative epidural analgesia was planned and bridging therapy was managed by the physician. A therapeutic dose of anoxaparin, one milligram per kilogram, was given twice daily. And the final dose of anoxaparin was given approximately 24 hours before the surgery. So that, becomes, that raises our first question, how long should a therapeutic dose of anoxaparin be before we perform neuraxial block? What is the time period that should elapse between the previous dose of low molecular weight heparin given in a therapeutic dose and neuraxial puncture? Again, we'll just start off with warfarin. As, as for revision, warfarin needs to cease five days before and there needs to be a normal INR at the time of neuraxial puncture. In terms of the bridging therapy, if a patient's had one milligram per kilogram BD of anoxaparin or 1.5 milligrams of anoxaparin daily, at least 24 hours should elapse between the last dose and your axial puncture. But the key here, it's a minimum period that should elapse. So once we've had the operation and we want to recommence anticoagulant therapy, how long we should we wait? In this case, in this real case, therapeutic dose of low molecular weight heparin was given at 2,200 hours on the day of surgery. So that's approximately 12 hours after the completion of surgery. Did the practitioners, practitioners allow a sufficient time from the end of surgery to the administration of the next therapeutic dose of low molecular weight heparin? And did, we, did they need to give a therapeutic dose of low molecular weight heparin? Could they have given a prophylactic dose? So the guidelines are fairly straightforward. If a patient's had a therapeutic dose of low molecular weight heparin, then at least, if, if, sorry, if, a, if, a, if the decision is made to give a therapeutic dose of low molecular weight heparin in the post-operative period, then a minimum of 24 hours should um, occur before that drug's given in the context of normal surgical hemostasis. Even in the context of a prophylactic dose of anoxaparin, six to eight hours should elapse from the completion of surgery and the first dose of low molecular weight heparin. And again, normal surgical hemostasis should, be, should have been established. The next question is, when can the practitioners remove the indwelling catheter since the previous dose of low molecular weight heparin? 
And in this case, this real case, on post-operative day one, the therapeutic dose of low molecular weight heparin was omitted in, very wisely in the morning by the anaesthetist. And the enoxaparin was prescribed at 2200 hours on post-operative day one. So that means there would have been 24 hours between the, from the previous dose of enoxaparin to the next dose. Now what happened here, so this, this brings up to our next question, how long should we, la sh how long should we allow um, from when we remove the indwelling catheter and the previous dose? And again, we should allow 24 hours, which was, which was the uh, time period that was allowed here. But it's important to note that the guidelines, the ASRA guidelines, do not recommend continuous epidural catheter techniques if therapeutic dosages are planned because the risks are simply too high. If a patient had received a prophylactic dose, then we should allow 10 to 12 hours from the previous dose of low molecular weight heparin and removal of epidural catheter. So what that means in practice is we can give a standardised time of administration, such as um, 8 p.m. at night, and then we can allow a 12-hour period, and then the epidural catheter can be removed in the morning, and then the patient can undergo at appropriate neurological surveillance during daylight hours. In this case, the therapeutic dose was given at the time that it was prescribed, but a one to two hour gap only was allowed between removal of epidural catheter and the subsequent um, dosage of low molecular weight heparin. So that brings us to the next question, how long after removal of the catheter can we restart the medication? And again, we don't have clear guidelines simply because therapeutic dosages of low molecular weight heparin are not recommended concurrently with a continuous epidural catheter technique. In the context of a prophylactic dose, a minimum of two hours is recommended um, after the epidural catheter is removed. But in all cases, careful neurological surveillance is required after removal of the epidural catheter. So in this case, unfortunately, this patient on post-operative day two developed back pain and lower limb weakness. This occurred after hours, as it commonly does. The back pain and lower limb weakness was thought to be related to surgical or patient issues, as occurs on occasion. The patient developed paraplegia. At that time, the surgical team thought that the patient may have had an epidural hematoma. The patient was then emergently transferred to a neurosurgical centre and had a large thoracolumbar sacral epidural hematoma evacuated. At this point, this was approximately 48 hours since the onset of back pain and lower limb weakness. This is normally associated with a very poor outcome, but in this case, the patient was lucky and made a full neurological recovery. So what are the lessons from this case? Safety really depends on meticulous attention to detail in the administration, both in the timing and dosage of anticoagulants and epidural anesthesia in the perioperative period. And it's important to have a careful sh um, shared risk stratification uh, uh, process. So we discuss the cases with the haematologist. We discuss the cases with all the practitioners who will be looking after the patient and that there are very clear communication guidelines. It's important to recognise that therapeutic anticoagulation with low molecular weight heparin in particular and epidural catheterisation is not recommended. Constant neurologic surveillance is, is mandatory in any patient who has a continuous post-operative epidural analgesic technique. And in this particular case, margins of safety in the applied time intervals um, were, were absent. In conclusion, I just, uh, and, and also in conclusion, I'd just like to uh, go back to what I said earlier on in the presentation, that we must refer to established guidelines that have been written by the professional societies. We must be very familiar with these um, guidelines, very familiar with the pharmacology of the individual drugs. We must be aware of new drugs until the safety data has been published. We need to know the pharmacology of these drugs. We need to be familiar with the guidelines, as I said. And it's important to note that the recommended time periods that are published within these guidelines are minimum, minimum time periods only, and we have to assess individual risk benefit um, individually for every patient, for every operation. So thank you for your attention. And if there's anything that I said that you thought was controversial or